Tom Watson used to be a friend of mine. I admired him. I even persuaded a lot of my family members who were not like me, expelled out of the Labour Party, to vote for him as deputy leader of the party. But Tom Watson has supported Jeremy Corbyn like the rope supports the hanging man. When Tom Watson was a friend of mine, he was a flatmate of Len McCluskey, the great trade union leader, the leader of Britain's biggest trade union, Unite. But Tom Watson has betrayed him too, and today he returned to the fray, absolutely gratuitously launching an attack on McCluskey. We'll be talking to Steve Howell, author of Game Changer, former advisor to Jeremy Corbyn, about this fresh outbreak of wholly unnecessary inter nissan conflict inside the Labour Party and asking the question, it's only me that asks it, whether having an elected deputy leader is in fact a good idea. There's no, uh, um, it's no accident that there's no elected deputy leader of Unite. There can only be one cook in the kitchen, as everybody knows. And we'll be talking about the curse of gambling. When I was virtually the only member of Parliament opposing even the establishment of the National Lottery, there were many divisions, that's votes, in the House of Commons, in which only me and the late Reverend Ian Paisley were found in the no lobby. Now, the Reverend Paisley was fond of saying no me, not so much, but as the Reverend Paisley pointed out to me, it's come to something when only me and a little pape like you are in the lobby against the devil's buttermilk. And I knew what he meant, because I believe that gambling is the curse of the working classes. And the lower down the food chain of gambling, the worse, more pernicious, more despicable it is. And it doesn't get much lower than the fixed odd betting machines in betting shops, which proliferate. I had a foreign visitor with me just the other day in the car in London. He said to me, uh, I won't name the company, but my goodness, that company has a high profile here in London. And that company seemed to have, does have, a betting shop on every corner. And in the corner of that betting shop is a mach machine, which, until today, you could bet £100 a spin. That's now been reduced to £2. £2 too much, in my opinion, but it is a tremendous step forward and a tremendous feather in the cap of those who've been campaigning for it because it was done in the teeth of opposition from the gambling companies that seem to have proliferated so incredibly in our country. As I've said to you before, when I was a kid, gambling in Britain was an illegal practice, except at racecourses. There was a thing called a bookies runner who was usually a rather a scurvy looking individual standing on a street corner surreptitiously ex accepting bets from working men and some women and then running off to a house somewhere and laying those bets off you got a little piece of paper telling my grandfather used to send me to uh, that uh, bookies runner you got a little piece of paper and that was all you had it was all done on trust but we've gone from that to when you watch, as I do, as a virtual insomniac, television, late at night, early hours of the morning, gambling is everywhere. And I agree with the Reverend Ian Paisley. It is, indeed, the devil's buttermilk. And we'll be talking about the royal wedding. I bet you never thought you'd hear me say that. I'm a Republican. I'm against monarchy. I think it's a foolish, childish, ruritarian fantasy life, the kind of thing my children would believe in, princes and princesses. But I am not going to pretend to you I have no interest in this particular royal wedding. It's the only royal occasion in which I've ever had any interest at all. And that's because of the colour of this story. For the first time, a black woman is marrying in 
to the British royal family. For the first time, a woman raised as a Catholic is marrying in to the top reaches of the British royal family. A divorcee, no less. An American divorcee, no less. When was the last time that happened? Wallace Simpson, oh, what could possibly go wrong? I'm interested in it from that standpoint. But I'm also interested in it from this. The British establishment, the British state, has made yet another monumental series of blunders in their handling of the arrangements for this wedding. How does it come to pass? Now, call me old-fashioned. Maybe I'm speaking as a man of my age and class. But I always thought, especially if you were a traditionalist, that the groom asked the father of the bride for his daughter's hand. I certainly did, didn't you? Harry hasn't even met the father of the bride, and he's not now going to meet him on Saturday because the man has been caught up in the mother of all imbroglios. If he didn't have a heart problem before all this, well, he's certainly got one now. Why didn't the palace send a pinstriped, bowler-hatted civil servant to the United States to mind, manage, cosset, protect the extended family and especially the father and mother of the woman who's about to enter the British royal family. Or as Eamon said to me just the other day when I raised this, even a retired Fleet Street newspaper editor, a wizened old veteran of the news business, send them there, pay them a fee, tell them to manage, handle all of this. And then we might not have this plethora of paparazzi pose pictures selling stories for money, writing books, hitting out, sisters falling out, all the things that are making this royal wedding looking extremely dodgy, sketchy, before it's even happened. I can see the Diana phenomenon stretching out in front of this married couple before they've even tied the knot. But should we? be paying for this wedding. We were told, I announced it here, that the state would not be paying, that the royal family themselves would be paying for this wedding. That turns out to be, uh, well, rather economical with the actuality. Should homeless people be being swept literally off the streets of Windsor in preparation for this royal wedding? Should Jeremy Corbyn be being attacked on television because he's attending an economics conference rather than watching a royal wedding on the television? Because that's what's happening on the news tonight. Corbyn under fire. What is it this time? Did he not do up his tie? Did he not bow low enough? Did he not sing lustily enough the national anthem? No, because he's not. He confessed. That's the word they used. He confessed that he was not going to be watching live the royal wedding. I will be watching it, actually. Me and my missus are going to at the opening of a new tea room, which is showing it live. Because, hey, everybody loves a wedding, don't they? <laughs>